Hello, my name is Dr. Chris Drew, and this is The Syncretic Bodies of Student Athletes, Repetition as a Literacy Practice. This paper is a snapshot of the research from a year-long ethnographic study of a men's NCAA Division II basketball team. Analysis of the database from this research revealed three important findings. One, these student athletes' training methods influence their literacy. Two, these student athletes have sophisticated literacy skills that reflect their sophisticated cognition. And three, these student athletes appreciated and were highly engaged with their training regimens. <clears throat> there were also three more generalizable findings that revolve around the concepts of repetition, surveillance, and breakdown. The research and theory that either framed this project or formed the foundation for it include the work of Deborah Hawhey, Julie Cheville, James G., Brian Street, David Barton and Mary Hamilton, Pierre Bourdieu, and others. Uh, two key terms that don't uh, receive nearly enough attention are uh, literacy events and literacy practices, which come from new, new literacy studies definitions of each. I'll be happy to share with you an elaborated discussion of these terms. Uh, for now, however, this paper focuses on the role of repetition for shaping fundamental way of being in the literate lives of these subjects. Habitus and Hexus. Pierre Bourdieu's Habitus is a system of structures and principles that regulate practices. Habitus determines behaviors within a system without demanding a specified behavior via rules and regulations. Like James G.'s Discourse and Brian Street's Practices, Habitus structures beliefs, values, and ways of being within a milieu. Habitus is important for seeing how the materials within an ecology affect practices and beliefs and memory. Juxtaposed with Habitus is Hexus. If Habitus represents objective structures and systems that shape practices, Hexus represents individual actions performed by individual bodies. For Bourdieu, there is an inseparable relationship between habitus and hexus. They affect each other. Hexus is, in short, the bodily expression through motor functions of systematic techniques that are, quote, charged with a host of social meanings and values. That's from Bourdieu. And hexus is important because hexus is the embodied, taken-for-granted manifestation of habitus. Hexus is habitus unquestioningly performed. Together, habitus and hexus allow for the term sociophysical. Together, these two concepts fill out Street's notions of literacy events and literacy practices. Literacy is not just social, and it is not only ideological. It is physical, too. Hence the term sociophysical. In regards to reading and writing, though simple, the terms event, practice, and activity each embody a sophisticated complex of bodily disciplining, mental processing, social support, and, and material access. Physically, a body is required to move its eyes, or if you're blind, your fingers, across pages of a text in a systematic way. A body is also required to assume an enabling posture, sitting and keeping the body at rest for periods long enough to engage a substantive piece of text is an often taken for granted element of 21st century reading and writing processes. These bodily elements of literacy are bodily expressions hexus, of larger literacy practices, habitus, and the way they are uh, <clears throat> accomplished are peculiar to their local community. The larger structures, such as schools, that shape these smaller bodily expressions can be superimposed onto the literacy practices and literacy events, respectively. The data from my research demonstrates how the habitus of this athletics team shaped the bodily ways of being an individual athlete. Study hall and basketball practice are used as examples of a larger body of structuring structures that created specific behaviors, including disciplined ways of engaging in literate activities. Scripted repetition in basketball practice schedules. For each and every basketball practice, coach, along with his assistants, would decide on the objective for the day's practice along with specific skills and strategies to emphasize. The coaching staff would select various drills that would facilitate work on these skills strategies, and they would sequence them and then write them down by hand on a sheet of notebook paper. This would be the schedule of drills and activities for the day's practice. This was the basketball practice schedule, or the practice plan. 
At every single basketball practice, one of these practice schedules were in the hands of the coaching staff. These texts were not distributed to the players, though the players would often steal a glance at, at extra copies that were given to the, uh, to the managers. And just like the paper and pen that were highly visible in the opening epigraph, which I'm unable to share with you here, these texts, too, had a heavy-handed presence. The players were actually aware, aware of the role of these documents. Uh, elsewhere, I provide images of, these, of the actual practice schedules, which you can uh, reach out to me if you'd like to see. Um, these two images of practice plans illustrate the consistency of a repetitive methodology. The images illustrate the formatting of each practice plan. They are consistent. There is virtually no change from early in the season to late in the season. This consistency was intentional. Routine mediated the development of specific habits of both body and mind. Habits of body were developed to the point where the athletes didn't have to spend time thinking about the rules of a particular drill. Habits of mind were developed through the habituation process, which included inculcating values such as hard work and hustle, and norms, like always executing a drill precisely, such as touching lines when doing sprints. The practice plans, and thus the practices, are structured according to the amount of time spent on each drill. In the left-hand margin are the time increments. To the right is a description of the activity for each time slot. Occasionally, coach would include a diagram of a play or a drill to expedite the setup time for a new drill. Very little time is squeezed into the practice plan for transitioning from one drill to the next. Several prominent features of these documents are the regimented structure, time allotments, and the breakdown format of the day's activities. That is, the method of demonstrating the entirety of an activity and then breaking down that activity into constituent parts so as to practice the individual motor movements of said parts. Uh, but the most significant feature of the practice plan is something that doesn't even appear on the document proper. Repetition appears in the actions in the doing of the players and the coaches. The structure, timing, and breakdown features of these documents have a direct relationship with repetition, where and how it manifested, the philosophy behind it, and the effects. Again, this training method was for the purposes of disciplining the body so that the mind could react almost instinctively. It was during practices when the coaches would review specific aspects of a drill. The coaches would explicate the purpose of a drill and explain how it fit into the larger philosophy they were trying to achieve as a team. The cerebral elements of the drills and skills development were incorporated in the conversations about each drill. Then the players would perseverate the targeted skill until it was habituated, until it became an unconscious way of moving on the court. Hexus. To experience the actual basketball practice, either as an observer or as a participant, is to either see or do activities over and over and over. Often the only thing that puts any restraints on the amount of repetition are the 20, 15, 10, and, 5, and 5 minute blocks of time dedicated to the specific drills. In fact, that is what the time allotments are for, to limit by time and not by count the number of times that participants perform an act. As an example, here's a drill from one of the practice planes. Five on zero, half court, dummy O, with uh, baseline out of bounds plays, numbers one, two, three, and four. <clears throat> the first 15 minutes of practice on this particular day were dedicated to reviewing the various offensive plays in the team's repertoire. For each, for each play, each of the five offensive players has specific duties or movements that they must perform in a highly choreographed sequence. To master these movements and their timing, the student athletes study the plays by repeatedly performing them under the watchful and constantly corrective eye of the coaches. First they run their half-court sets. Uh, then they review four of their out-of-bounds plays. They repeat each play at least four times. First the blue squad runs through them twice, and then the white squad runs through them twice. <clears throat> Not only does each player perform the play twice, but he also sees it performed two times. If there are any mistakes made, they repeat the play as many times as are needed until each one is run without mistakes. The playbook consists of dozens of plays, only a selection of which are performed on a given day. They perform the selected plays over and over and over again until the 15 ded dedicated minutes uh, expire. The collection of repetitious activities is represented by the text of the, of the practice plan. The practice plan is, in fact, the impetus for the activity. As well, the coaching staff spends time explaining particular aspects of or motivations for the various drills. They pause to talk about the activities and think deeply and critically about the activities they are performing. 
While the players are in the process of habituating the motor movements, this talk also has a forward-looking effect in that it allows these players to imagine a bevy of dynamic situations in which the drills will be performed during a game. According to Barton and Hamilton's definition of literacy practices, this talk about text makes it a literacy event. The text directly derives the specific activities of the particular time and day. Even though the texts were never not present, it's important that I point out the training traditions that are the norm in high-level basketball practices. These norms, practices, demonstrate the reciprocal nature of activities, events, practices for shaping ethics of behavior and ways of being. Repetitious behavior is a habit of body and habit of mind that became a habituated way of behaving across domains. Repetition is not just an act or a practice. It is a way of being, an ethics of behavior, as I call it. Repetition was a method of training that infused these subjects' ways of being. As a method, repetition is a part of the, of the habitus of the discourse community of sports. It is a taken-for-granted aspect of athletics training at every level from peewee leagues all the way to professional sports. Interestingly, as far as the data for this study is concerned, only during basketball workouts was repetition explicitly demanded as part of the subject's training model, either in academics or athletics, or socially. It was in the weight room that coaches told players to, quote, get your reps, or your repetition. It was in the gymnasium that coaches shouted for players to, quote, get your shots, get as many shots up as possible in succession. It was during basketball practices that players did pick and roll drills for 10 minutes at a time. Coaches demanded that the players repeat these acts. The players, without question or concern, repeated these and other basic acts nearly every day for two to three hours. The data and analysis tells us that the domain of athletics relied much more heavily on repetition as the foundational approach to instilling content. And here's what, where we get to the important part. The claim that emerges from the data of this ethnography is that repetition is the foundational element of student-athletes' training methods that instills habits that they can perform unthinkingly. This habituation becomes, for these student-athletes, a way of behaving, a way of being. It is how they conceptualize the work of learning new material, and it transfers to other domains of their lives as well. Uh, my name again is Dr. Chris Drew, and if you'd like to follow up or have any questions about uh, this particular presentation or the larger body of research from which it comes, uh, please reach out to me at cdrew1 at yahoo.com. Uh, again, that's c-d-r-e-w, the number one, at yahoo.com. Thank you.